But does all this really matter? We're just mathematicians, right? We do math. Why should we really be concerned about these things? Well, I think we should. Good reason. Many of you have seen this before. So I consider mathematics. So firstly, consider a knife. Okay, we've all used a knife before. Life can be useful. You can do stuff, cut fruit, chop down a tree. <coughs> but a knife can also be harmful. We're made aware of this. Our parents tell us, you know, don't, don't keep cutting the onion or lose a finger. Okay, that understanding is there. And a spoon. Well, last I tried, I can't lose a finger with a spoon. So less harmful. But also less useful. You gotta cut carrots, you got a spoon, you're not having any dinner. So which is better? Okay. Life is more useful, therefore it's better. It can also be more harmful. What sort of harm? Okay, would you give a baby a knife? If you're a responsible human being, which I'm hoping you are, because you're here, that's just probably no. Why? Because a baby doesn't know how to use a knife. It'll start swinging it around, it'll maybe chop another baby sitting too close to it or something, stab the television. So, no, a baby doesn't understand how to use this properly, it's not safe. They give the baby the knife. You give a baby a spoon. Has its yogurt or whatever. Can you bring a knife onto a plane? The answer is usually no. Unless you want 12 large you know, security agents jumping on you. Is it because we don't know how to use a knife that you can bring you can't bring it onto a plane? It's actually the opposite. It's because you do know how to use it. Because you know exactly how a knife works, you can't board a plane with a knife. Because you can do bad things with it. But you can go onto a plane with a spoon. Knife is more useful, knife is more harmful. Who's the spoon? Mathematics. I even lectured this course. What about the theory of languages and computation? Part two. Come along, it's interesting. Now let's consider the entire wealth of mathematical knowledge. There's a whole library over there. Yeah, over there, full of these books. Compared to a knife. I claim, maybe you'd agree, but I think that the entire corpus of mathematical knowledge in the human race is slightly more useful than a knife. It's just a weeny, weeny, weeny bit. And thus, by extension, can be slightly more harmful. Again, a tiny bit. Actually, maybe a lot. But guess what? From the age of zero, you're taught not to mess with these because they can hurt you and hurt others around you. From what age are you taught not to mess with this because it can hurt you and hurt people around you? Who has ever had somebody, apart from me, tell them that mathematics, just as it can be useful, can be harmful? Hands. One. One, one and a half. One. Okay. See how we're missing something here? You know, somewhere along the line, this message never got caught up in the syllabus design or in the way that we talk about communicate mathematics. It just never made it there. But it's here now. We're talking about it. It's important. And you'll think it's important because you came today. You're already self-selected. So my job here is much easier. In essence, I want to invert the mathematical universe over the boundary of this room. So I want everyone who's in here to go out, and everyone who's out of here to come in. Because if you're self-selected to come to this mathematics lecture, you're already three quarters of the way there. Still got some more stuff to teach you, but you're three quarters of the way there. You've decided this is rubbish, it's not for me, that's the person I want to come in here. So next time you come, bring a friend. And if you try to decide which friend to bring, find the one who kicks and screams the most about not coming, and that's the person to bring. Maximize your impact. Optimize. <laughs> <laughs> Optimize over reluctance. <laughs>
when I talk about knives and spoons and orphanages and calculus, does this happen in real life? Real, real life. You know, out beyond the gatehouse, real life. Six months ago, we have all came across, come across some news articles about an organization called Cambridge Analytica, an SCL group. This has been going on in the news for quite a while, but it really sort of hit the front pages in about March this year. <coughs> Basically what happened, people were doing targeted political advertising, which swayed some pretty close, pretty important elections. When I say people, who do I mean? The people working for Cambridge Analytica and a CL group were data scientists. There were about a hundred of them, slightly less. What's a data scientist? You know? Don't say a scientist of data. <laughs> Where do you find data scientists? Do they grow on trees? Do you go off the shelves in Tesco? Where do I get these data scientists from? Any ideas where they come from? They come from math departments, and physics departments, and computer science departments. One of these data scientists, in fact, was a PhD student in theoretical astrophysics which here in Cambridge we call mathematics. Other places call it physics, but we believe that's mathematics. It's a theoretical field of study. It is mathematics. You sit there and think about it. You can call it physics if you like. My point is that this person decided that their skills in theoretical physics, where they studied star patterns, star networks, I realized that these skills in theoretical astrophysics could be exported to studying people networks. Exact same governing equations, exact same techniques, exact same algorithms. So all of a sudden you've gone from studying stuff that is several light years away to people that live next door to you. Same skills, same training, Slightly different application. Hundreds of data scientists. What were they doing? Sending very clever political adverts. Let me be very clever. So say you're a Hillary supporter, and I want to send you an advert to vote for someone who isn't Hillary Clinton. Some person. And I'm able to infer from, say, your Facebook profile that, that you're a Hillary supporter, but, you know, you sort of probably, maybe, votes? Not certainly, but, but you know, you're, you're, you're a person who goes to vote. Do I send you an advert saying, don't vote Hillary, she's crap? Well, no, because I can sort of infer that that's never going to work. So what do I do? I send you an advert saying, hey everyone, Hillary's doing super good, she's definitely going to win in your state. Go team, we've all done so well. Yay Hillary. She's a shoe in to win in your state. What do you think when you read that ad? Two things you might think. First thing, great, Hillary's going to win. So when it comes to Tuesday morning to go and vote, you're like, you know what? There's a sitcom on TV, I might watch that, but there's some funny cat videos on YouTube, watch those instead. What's the point of going to vote? She's going to win. Secondly, who do you think that advert is coming from? If you receive an advert that says, Go Hillary, who do you think has administered that advert to? A reasonable person. Not someone with a math PhD, a reasonable person. What do they, who do they think has sent that advert to? the foundation or the Hillary's campaign or something like this. Do so you think Hillary is sitting in And what's my Hillary? And what's one of her opponents? 
components. So what we're able to do is use clever analysis, mathematics, to turn people's minds and turn an election. We're not reading an election itself. No one's stuffing ballot boxes. We're reading the electorate by exploiting what we understand about them. They don't know we understand about them. That is what we can do. We can turn elections. 100 people with a budget of a couple of million can start swinging massive elections. This is real. What's also real is people in finance thinking they have a good and clever understanding of mathematics and decide they can invent new financial products like capitalized debt obligations in the early mid noughties which basically says, you know, take this pile of stuff. Sorry, take this pile of stuff. And I, and I cut it in very clever ways. And then I do some calculus. Then I've not cut this stuff up into something that's worth more than the original pile. Good team. This is exactly what we did. We took mortgages, a pile of them, we cut them in a clever way, we did some calculus, and we said, right, now these pieces, now the sum of the values of these pieces, so I've got, you know, being odd, the whole thing, and being one down to the n, and now, based on the sum of the values of the bi, is greater than being odd. So by doing nothing, we've done something. Created value out of nothing. We did this with the mathematics was working really well until one day it stopped working. In about late 2007, November 2007, the actual system started to go to crunch. And it was in late 2008 that the entire passive cards collapsed. This is the work of mathematicians. Working in finance, thinking I understood how the models worked, thinking that their models were accurately reflecting what's happening in the book. Thinking that, that, that drawing some stuff and calculus on the board gave them all the understanding information they needed to break up mortgages into pieces and understand them perfectly and create value by just doing math. That is real. It is extraordinarily real. And 10 years on, we're still feeling the impact of that. Maybe you could say, okay, people in Cambridge Analytica, people in banking, were trying to, 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 they sort of knew that they were trying to be greedy. People in CA knew they were working for particular political organizations. People in banking knew they were trying to make more money by doing this. So maybe, okay, that way they had some idea in their head. But surely if you, if, if you don't think you're doing something bad, then you can't be doing something bad. I'm sure this is, this is the case. I think I'm doing something good, and I'm doing something good. A lot of people have taken to using a, an app called Tinder. <laughs> this app pairs you with people. In some mystical way. I've never seen a source code for Tinder. I don't know how it works. People use this app a lot to find a partner. Short term, medium term, long term. Depends how you feel. Who's designing that app? And if you think that the way Tinder works is it takes a random person from a given radius of the gender you're looking for and aside and you know says, how about this one, how about this one, then you've kind of missed the point of what's going on. Because that is not how Tinder works. <coughs> Tinder does all sorts of clever thinking to decide who you get paired with, who you don't get paired with. And who's doing that work? Is there a team of psychologists 
there deciding, right, you know, these two people will have a nice harmonious relationship, these two people might fight too much, so we don't want to, we don't want to occur that. Now, are there geneticists or medical doctors saying, well, you know, these two people have a high proportion of, of, of some genetic predisposition, you know, apparently they're going to have kids, they'll, they'll, have, they'll have six heads and 12, 12 feet or something, so let, let, let's not pair them together. No. Tinder, the actual app itself and how it pairs you, is designed, developed, implemented by a room full of mathematicians and computer scientists, a couple of physicists. We are the ones making these decisions. And we might be doing it for good. Okay, we've done this thing, I mean, we want, we want to, to maximize you know, the goodness of, of, of dating. Because we know so much about maximizing the goodness of, this is our area of expertise. This is what we're trained for. <laughs> okay, I remember going on this calculus class going, right, the dating be kind. That's what he was thinking with the apple. Hey, people can date better if I do this. No. Freaking no. I didn't be claim, you understand. We do machine learning, or we write clever algorithms. Clever by our perspective. All the app development for Tinder is done in California. Every single developer is there. The only people who get that hire outside there are people in marketing. So maybe you have to, like, I don't know, change the layout for people in Germany, or change the color background for people in Spain. I don't know. But the actual how the app works and, and, and pairs you or doesn't pair you with people, that's us. We decide who has sex with whom in the 21st century. This is the way millennials meet. It's large scale. Tinder has a couple of hundred people working for it. And hundreds of millions of users all aged between 18 or 16 if they're lying on their profile, to sort of 35. And what's important about that age bracket, that's when people have children. Tinder has the capacity to implement the largest eugenics program the world has ever seen. Who has stopped to think about that? And who are the ones doing that? We are. I'm not saying they're deliberately doing anything like this, I'm saying they have that ability and they lack the training to ask the relevant questions. Because they're optimizing over things like most matches, or most enjoyments, most fun. Is it always fair to optimize over what the user wants? Do we always allow this in society? I mean, people are free to choose, right? Do we always like people in society to, 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 to get what they're asking for? <clears throat> or do we have sometimes some rules which say, no, even if you want that, you can't have it. It's not that good for you. You know, if you want to optimize for people who come to, to, to your cafe, start hanging little, little dishes of cocaine. And lots of people will come to your cafe and they're free to choose and do with you. Yay! <laughs> But society says no. You can't just optimize what people want because they might not fully understand what's good for them, what's bad for them. So we say, well, you know, we've got to sort of intervene here. No, don't, don't smoke that, snort that, drink that, whatever. Calm down. So giving users the option here, to do what they like on the platform. And then say, okay, you know, you're enjoying this more. We, we know what you like, so we'll give you more of it. We know what you like, we'll give you more of it. You don't necessarily know what's good for you. And so can the mathematicians say, well, it's not my problem. The users are, are, are deciding. Well, how many of your users have a degree in psychology or a degree in genetics? Maybe some. But probably not most. So we are taking on the job of that. With no training, no understanding, no introspection. We're never told 